All right. Hello, everyone. It's me, Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. And we have an update in the Stebbins v. Uh, Polano case, or I guess uh, this is Stebbins v. Google. But uh, I think there's uh, this is connected to a bunch of other things that, uh, that have been going on. If you remember this case, we've been going over this. This has been going on since 2021 or, or earlier. Um, there's a lot of docket entries in this case. I think we started with uh, a complaint uh, back in 2021, and now we are finally at uh, February of 2023, and the thing is still going on. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. So let's um, let's take a look at what the court filed, and um, we'll figure it all out. So here is the new ruling in Stebbins v. Google. I will, uh, I guess, have to figure out what is happening with between this and Stebbins v. Polano and uh, what everybody's telling me. But um, let's take a look. Pending before the court is defendant Google's motion to dismiss and declare David Stebbins a vexatious litigant. Plaintiff's motion to strike defendant's motion to dismiss. Plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment and plaintiff's motion for leave to file an amended complaint. Plaintiff is, of course, David Stebbins. Uh, Acer Thorn. Um, the court finds the motions can be resolved without oral argument. The court grants the motion to dismiss. The court grants the defendant's motion to declare plaintiff a vexatious litigant, denies plaintiff's motion to strike, denies plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment, and denies plaintiff's motion for leave to file an amended complaint. So plaintiff was seeking to file uh, leave, was seeking leave to file an amended complaint. Uh, Laura, hello, welcome. Saw this earlier today from Sid Alpha. Excellent. Yes, uh, Sid Alpha was one of Acer Thorne's victims here. Further, the court orders plaintiff to remove from YouTube a recording of the Rule 26F scheduling conference from March 30th of 2023 to delete copies of this or any recording plaintiff has retained between plaintiff and defendant. Wait a second. Okay, here. You're not allowed to record stuff that goes on between the parties you're not allowed to record the court's proceedings without permission you're not allowed to you're not allowed to record things that's a big freaking deal so even though this is just a sentence in here where a judge is telling acer thorn to delete this recording there could be more fallout to having made an illegal recording of court proceedings so if if this is all that happens then acer thorn's getting off light on that one. Uh, we'll circle back to that, I think. Um, Kaylee, if you could help figure out which case is which. So I'm confused. I thought this was Stevens v. Polano, but apparently it's Ste it's Stevens v. Google. Um, maybe we'll get to figuring out what happened with Polano. Background. Plaintiff, Stevens, is a YouTuber and Twitch streamer who goes by the name Acer Thorne. Another YouTuber has set up a YouTube channel titled Acer Thorn, the true Acer Thorn, to harass, dox, or impersonate plaintiff and infringe on his copyright. I guess that's according to plaintiff. Plaintiff alleges that a frame of plaintiff's live stream has been used as the icon for the Acer Thorn, the true Acer Thorn channel. Okay, so there's this is this is not Polano. This is somebody set up a uh, a fake channel to mock him, an, an impersonator, basically, uh, to mock him, I guess. And he feels harassed, doxxed, and impersonated, you know, as you do when someone does those things. Plaintiff brings suit against defendant for copyright infringement for hosting the icon on its servers. Wait, I, okay, so I... Sorry, guys. I thought this was Stevan Z. Polano. It's not. This is not him versus Sid Alpha, but this is certainly a big deal um this is acer thord suing google over an icon okay but it's it's still going to be interesting i promise february 10th 2023 plaintiff filed an ex parte motion for a protective order asking the court to advise the defendant to tread cautiously when making arguments against plaintiff without actually backing them up with evidence is this is this how we make legal arguments? Is this how we talk to a court? We ask a court to advise the defendant to tread cautiously when making arguments without 
backing them up with evidence. No, no, that's not how we make legal arguments. Um, how, how would I say something like that as an attorney? The, so first, I wouldn't file an ex parte motion because that's a motion without the opposing party. So, you know, you need to have grounds for a motion. You want to pick your motion carefully. What am I asking for? If I need to ask the court to caution the opposing side to file things with evidence, well, see, there I'm violating one of Sun Tzu's you know, rules for, for the art of war. Uh, never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. So if I was the opposing party and I saw my, uh, my, um, my opposing party uh, filing something without evidence backing it up or, or, or you know, otherwise not supporting their case, I would let them. I would let them not support their case and then make my case pointing out the flaws in their case. This is not a situation where you ask one parent to scold the other child because you didn't like the way the other child, you know, your sibling treated you. Uh, that's what this, that's what this sounds like when you, when you do it this way. March 6th, defendant filed a motion to dismiss. March 7th, plaintiff filed a motion to strike defendant's motion to dismiss. Uh, usually we adjudicate motions to dismiss on the merits. Um, why would you motion to strike a motion to dismiss? Well, only if it was basically a, a vexatious pleading, you know, something empty and, and not a motion to dismiss, not a meritorious motion to dismiss. So, yes, there are circumstances where you could strike. Well, the judge is going to explain that too, but no, uh, we don't file a motion to strike. We answer the motion to dismiss with a, a opposition uh, in support, or excuse me, a, um, an opposition in support. Yeah, that's, that's the words for it. Um, a, um, a response in opposition. March 7th, plaintiff also filed a motion for extension of time. Uh, because if his motion to strike is granted even partially, then the portions of the motion to dismiss will not require a response. The court denied an extension of time for failing to provide good cause. So he was asking the court to kind of queue it up so that if one was denied, then he wouldn't have to answer the other one, or if one was granted. April 3rd, plaintiff filed a motion for partial summary judgment. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, Par partial summary judgment on a case that's three months old. Am I am I am I am I nuts here? This this was the this was a 2023 case, right? This was this is not Stebbins v. Polano. This is Stebbins v. Google, and let me let me try to bring that up in court, listener. Instead, this is uh, 00322. So if I go back up here, thank you very much. Very long docket. And go to 23 uh, CV00322. What do I get? Do I get Stebbins v. Google in here someplace? Page one of three. I could I could have put the, yeah, it could just be helpful if I put party name Stebbins. Your, no results. Am I, am I missing something? Oh, it's 323, not 223. I don't like the way the courts um, docket their cases with the same numbers around the country. It makes it hard to find. Stebbins, Stebbins, Stebbins is in here, I'm sure. Stebbins v. Google, here we go. January 20th, so yes, three months later, he files a, uh, a motion to... Um, Motion for summary judgment, April 3rd, so literally three months later. June 6th, plaintiff filed an emergency motion to appear remotely and an emergency motion for recusal. The court denied plaintiff's motions because, as stated in its previous order, motions, motion hearings are in person and no reasonable person would question the court's impartiality from the court's adherence to its orders. <laughs> Uh, plaintiff filed a motion for leave to appear remotely. The 
court denied it. Uh, plaintiff filed a motion for leave to file an amended complaint. On July 27th, the parties appeared. Uh, the court, uh, the parties appeared the court for a case management, okay, appeared before the court for a case management conference. Okay, so that's what's happened. Discussion. Plaintiff's motion for leave to file an amended complaint. So we started the case in January of 2023, and we've already asked for leave to file an amended complaint by the middle of 2023. So something you know, really major has to have happened for you to, you know, need to do that. Plaintiff argues his motion to file an amended complaint should be granted because his delay in filing was reasonable. First, he asserts that he was barred by race judicata based on prior rulings in this district. Race judicata is that one where you can't be charged with the same crime twice. Uh, you can't have a court adjudicate the same thing twice. You can't get a ruling in court A and then go file your lawsuit in court B and get a ruling in court B and then go file your lawsuit in court C and then, it, you know, somebody's going to notice that eventually and, and you know, that'll be resolved under race judicata. The, you know, basically you can't do it over and over and over again. Second, he claims his request will save the judiciary time and resources. Quote, even if the court insists on dismissing the infringement claim over the channel icon... There is nothing the court can do to stop me from simply raising the other two infringement claims in a new lawsuit. Guys, don't tell people what you're going to do when, like, that's your strategy. It, it, this is kid stuff. You, you, you don't tell the court, you know, if you don't do this, I'm just going to go around you. Because now the court knows that you're going to try to do that stuff and can stop you. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying he's right here. I just in general, like broadcasting your, you know, illicit intentions is not a good idea. There's nothing the court can do to stop me from simply raising the other two infringement claims in a new lawsuit. Uh, yes, yes, except declaring you a vexatious litigant can stop you. Jeez, you told everybody you were going to do that. The court might as well let me have this amended complaint just to save time and judicial resources. I've I've won already because I'm just going to annoy you further if you don't let me annoy you this time. Yeah, yeah. There's something wrong with this this um, this person. Under Rule 15 A2 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, a party may amend its pleading only with the opposing party's written consent or the court's leave. Moreover, the court should freely give leave to amend when justice so requires. Open and shut, he should get it justice so requires. However, a district court may in its discretion deny leave to amend due to undue delay or bad faith or dilatory motive on the part of the movement or repeated failure to cure deficiencies by amendments previously allowed, or undue prejudice to the opposing party by virtue of allowance of the amendment, and, finally, the futility of the amendment. Here the court finds there has been undue delay, prejudice, and bad faith. Accordingly, the court denies the motion. First, plaintiff has been dilatory or delayed in seeking this amendment. Plaintiff has filed this motion six months after commencing the case. Plaintiff cites another case in this district as the reason for the delay. On July 6, 2022, in another case before Judge Jeffrey White, the judge issued an order declaring all of my copyrighted works up to that point to be invalid and not subject to copyright protection. This included the April 18th live stream. Therefore, I did not include that infringement because, at the time the original complaint was written, it would have been barred by race judicata. Okay. However, the court notes the plaintiff has completely mischaracterized that order. There, the court discussed whether plaintiff's videos should be afforded the presumption of validity. So, presumption of validity is not the same thing as your copyrights are invalid. So the presumption of validity that is afforded by registration, quote, without the presumption of validity, plaintiff's allegations of ownership regarding the additional live streams are insufficient. Plaintiff does not allege facts that permit the court to assess whether the content is eligible for copyright protection. 
He does not describe the material or address how it meets any of the criteria for copyright protection, such as creativity or originality. Moreover, his allegations of copying are vague and conclusory. Accordingly, plaintiff fails to allege a viable infringement claim as to the remaining live stream videos. Back to the court. Moreover, plaintiff avers in his reply that there is no prejudice to his proposed uh, addition of the two parties and two claims because he has alluded to them in his complaint. As such, plaintiff has provided no reason why he has not been dilatory in seeking amendment of his complaint. So it sounds like he was trying to add two parties and two claims six months later and didn't explain why that is fair to the opposing party. Uh, why would the defendant you know, now be on notice that he's defending or she's defending a different case? Well, I guess Google, it's defending a different case. It's not defending the same case that was brought in January. It's defending a different case. So no, you, if you want to bring a different case, you should have to start over again with a, another $400 filing fee and filing your complaint all over again, starting from scratch. Um, if you need to merely correct a mistake that you made in the original complaint or something, yeah, that's much more likely to be granted and you know, much better grounds for the thing. Second, defendant would be prejudiced by plaintiff's proposed amendment. Briefing for defendant's motion to dismiss, as well as multiple other motions discussed in this order, has been completed. If defendant is given leave to amend, the motion practice would simply restart with resources thus spent wasted. Given the, nu given, the number, given the number of motions filed by plaintiff, the court is wary of allowing plaintiff to manipulate the judicial system in such a manner. This situation is similar to another case in which plaintiff is involved, where plaintiff voluntarily dismissed a defendant in order to moot that party's men pending motion to dismiss. As the court there noted, the court does not endorse plaintiff's efforts to manipulate the litigation process and his blatant gamesmanship. That was Stebbins v. Polano. Lastly, the court is deeply concerned that plaintiff seeks to amend due to bad faith. As discussed above, plaintiff's motion is indicative of blatant gamesmanship. Moreover, plaintiff uh, brings several motions, excuse me, plaintiff brings several arguments that have no merit. Plaintiff continues to bring arguments regarding defendant's motion to dismiss and motion to declare plaintiff a vexation litigant and motion to declare plaintiff a vexatious litigant, briefing for both motions has closed. Importantly, the court is deeply disturbed regarding plaintiff's arguments based on statements by defendant during the party's meet and confer. So a meet and confer is a uh, Rule 26 uh, requirement. Um, the, before scheduling conference, before a status conference, before the judge, you have to meet and confer with your opposing party and basically decide what the issues are you pretty much go over the whole case from beginning to end um, you don't necessarily have to reveal your strategy or anything but you do have to disclose required evidence and you have to come up with a status report for the judge as to what are the issues in the case what do the parties agree on what do they not agree on how long do you think it's going to take to get this all done how much time do you need for discovery do you think you need a jury trial how much time do you need for the jury trial uh, not all these things have to be discussed in the rule 26 conference but these are things that will be discussed at a status conference and there are many other parts to rule 26 to disclose information at the start of a case so they're having a required meeting at the start of a case to discuss all of these details about the case and defendant allegedly made admissions so plaintiff appears to have recorded the conversation between the parties uploaded the recording to youtube and included the link to the publicly accessible recording in his reply. This is highly irregular and appropriate, and inappropriate. So he thinks, uh, Mr. Stebbins, or Acerthorn, thinks that the defendant is gonna say something important during this conference, so he records the conference and then, I guess, assumes or thinks that defendant made some kind of admission, which, yeah, sure, if, if the defendant said, yada 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 i'm just doing this to hurt you whatever um you know i don't have a meritorious case for some reason yeah that that would affect your case so yes you would want to bring some sort of admission against a party opponent 
before the judge, put it, put it on the record before the judge or jury, uh, not through recording your conversation illegally. If there's been some kind of admission, uh, maybe you use an affidavit, maybe you bring the witness into court, uh, you know, maybe the, the, the attorney that was the other side of the conversation, you know, testifies about it as a party, like as a, not, not a party, but as a witness, I, you don't record the conversation. And then if you did record the conversation, you know, you've broken a rule there. You've, you've basically committed some kind of offense, could be a crime in some places. You don't go and tell people about it. Like, this is, this is kid stuff, guys. Although a pro se litigant may be entitled to great leeway by the court, this does not excuse him from following basic rules of ethics and civility or the law. It is inherently unethical for an attorney to record a conversation with another attorney regarding the routine progression of litigation without the other party's knowledge or consent. This behavior raises suspicions, injures public confidence in the legal system, uh, in the legal profession and the legal system, seriously impedes relations between counsel, and exerts a chilling effect on the normal flow of communication between opposing parties. Here, there is no indication that defendant consented to being recorded, which may have privacy implications. In addition, plaintiff may not publicly disclose private conversations between the parties. Cal uh, yeah, California Penal Code Section 632 applies. Plaintiff should not also not share the recording with the court as the court is not convinced that it is not being presented for any improper purpose, such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. Uh, see also Local Rule 1-4, failure by counsel or a party to comply with any duly promulgated local rule or federal rule may be grounds for sanctions. Moreover, the running counter on YouTube indicates that there have been over 100 views of this recording. As such, there is a high likelihood that members of the public have already accessed this recording. Not only is plaintiff's behavior indicative of bad faith, but it is also appropriate for sanctions. Plaintiff is ordered to immediately remove the recording from YouTube, delete copies of this, or any recording plaintiff has retained between plaintiff and defendant, and cease any future recording. Failure to comply with the court's order may result in terminating sanctions with prejudice, uh, and dismissal is as allowed as a as a sanction. So plaintiffs leave to amend. So Acer Thorns leave to amend his complaint is denied. Then the plaintiff's motion for summary judgment. He moves the court to a judge that the Acerthorn, the true Acerthorn channel as a whole, is not a fair use channel. And therefore, that all other elements of the channel are entirely irrelevant to determining whether the icon is fair use. Remember, we're here because of an icon. Plaintiff asserts that the icon could be considered fair use if all elements of the YouTube channel were considered a fair use channel. This is not a legal definition. There's no such thing as a fair use channel. Don't don't get hung up on this. He's making this up. But the plaintiffs, per, but from plaintiffs' perspective, the YouTube channel's video library is not fair use, and therefore other channel elements are irrelevant for a fair use analysis of the icon. Plaintiff fails to define the term fair use channel or cite any legal authority to support his fair use arguments. Defendant argues that plaintiff's motion seeks an advisory opinion, does not establish that there is no genuine issue of uh, material fact, uh, the summary judgment standard, and does not establish that plaintiff is entitled to judgment as a matter of law also, the summary judgment standard. Um, a party may move for summary judgment identifying each claim or defense on which summary judgment is sought. The court will grant summary judgment if there's no dispute, no genuine dispute as to any material fact. And the movement, the party that initially moved for summary judgment, you know, if all those facts are true, does the law operate on those facts in a way that gets you a judgment? If so, great, you can have summary judgment. An issue of fact is genuine only if there is sufficient evidence for a reasonable jury to find for the non-moving party. That's also a weird way of saying, like, if the facts are in dispute, a real dispute, a dispute that a jury could find either way, 
you know, based on testimony, the jury could say, we feel, we feel this way, feel whatever. We find this way, we find that way. If there's no dispute that could reasonably result in a different decision, then that's not a genuine issue of material fact. The mere existence of a scintilla of evidence will be insufficient. There must be evidence on which a jury could reasonably find for the non-moving party. At the summary judgment stage, evidence must be viewed in the light most favorable to the non-moving party. So even though so we've got one party moving to summary judgment, we're going to then be very careful and give the most leeway to the non-moving party. And that's how we tell if we're ready to summarize this thing with a summary judgment. Here, plaintiff's motion lacks merit. This is Acerthorne's summary judgment motion. First, the court is unclear what plaintiff seeks. Plaintiff asks the court to conclude that the YouTube channel is not a fair use channel and is thus irrelevant to fair use analysis of the allegedly infringing icon. But as noted above, plaintiff failed to define the term fair use channel or cite to any legal authority to support his arguments. And even if the court were to consider the YouTube channel in relation to fair use, it is not evidence how this analysis would support plaintiff's motion for summary judgment. Moreover, as plaintiff alleges infringement of the icon, not the channel, whether Acerthorn, the true Acerthorn, is a fair use channel is not an element of plaintiff's copyright claim or defendant's fair use defense. The court does not find it appropriate to address this issue. Second, plaintiff has not attached or submitted admissible evidence to establish the existence of undisputed material facts. Okay, so when you file a motion for summary judgment, you have to include like a... a, a a document of undisputed facts. What what are you saying is in dispute? What are you saying is not in dispute anymore? And then you have to refer to those things. Basically, every every time you allege a fact, you have to tell the court where you got it from. Otherwise, how does the court know what you're saying? Are you just saying uh, sentences? Where, where are these sentences coming from? You need to cite to where the sentences are coming from because it's a motion for summary judgment. You're you're not at the pleading stage where you're telling everybody the story. Now you're at the technical stage where you're telling the judge, hey, we don't need to go to a jury trial because I've got this locked down. I've got all of this done from A to Z. My I's are dotted. My T's are crossed. My documents are signed. Everything is done and ready for you, judge. And obviously, Acer Thorne did not do that. And it was not done. It was not signed, sealed, and delivered. It's yours. It's It was incomplete and did not connect the claims to the facts. He's, he's, he's alleging about this fair use channel, trying to pretend or... I, I guess the legal concept is that a YouTube channel that's mocking someone mocking another channel or mocking Ace or Thorn, parodying, impersonating, whatever word you want to use, that that's some kind of entity for the copyright fair use analysis rather than a specific infringement that the, that the channel is the infringer. It, 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 sure, it could be. It could be that a, a channel that impersonates another channel could be committing copyright infringement, trademark infringement, unfair business practices, a number of things. Sure. But that's not what he said in his complaint. <laughs> so there's a disconnect. The, the complaint says uh, copyright infringement of an icon, and then he talks about how there's no defense because it's not a fair use channel. No, it needs to be a fair use defense, you know, analysis of a fair use defense of the claim, the same claim. Where were we? Plaintiff lists facts in his motion in a conclusory fashion that he avers are undisputed. While plaintiff attaches an email and what plaintiff asserts are screenshots taken from the opposing channel, the court does not consider these as they are new evidence and arguments raised in a reply brief. So this is another misunderstanding of how summary judgment works. You don't assert new things on summary judgment. You have previously spent 
the the two years of litigation, three years of litigation, building the record, building out the record with evidence and testimony and, and motions and plea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you've built out this record, and then when it's time to file your summary judgment motion, you simply refer to the record. Not not in one, you don't go one sentence, I refer to the record. No, no, no. You, you, fact one refers to the record here. Fact two refers to the record here. Fact three. And then when fact one, two, and three operate together under the law, I get a judgment. That's, that's the beginnings of how a summary judgment motion works. And he has not done that. He has what, this is six months into the thing, and he has obviously not yet built a record because we don't even have an answer to the complaint. We have a motion to dismiss. So there's been no discovery. There's been no testimony. There are no facts. There's no, there's nothing more than pleadings and a motion to dismiss. And then he jumps straight to summary judgment, which is not even the correct motion. It would be a motion for judgment on the pleadings at this stage because there's nothing more than pleadings. Lastly, plaintiff's argument about a fair use channel is devoid of citation to any authority. As such, the court is not convinced that plaintiff is entitled to summary judgment as a matter of law. Plaintiff brings a convoluted argument regarding which facts are judicially noticed or incorporated by reference. Moreover, plaintiff does not bring a cogent argument to meet his burden of persuasion for his motion Plaintiff may not file a motion devoid of evidence or authority or shift the burden to defendant. Accordingly, plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment is denied. Yeah. Uh, plaintiff does not bring a caution argument to meet his burden of persuasion is a weird way of saying, you know, the, the court's unconvinced. Plaintiff's motion to strike. So this is, again, plaintiff Acer Thorns motion to strike, defendant's motion to dismiss, and defendant's motion to declare plaintiff a vexatious litigant. Under Rule 12F, the court may strike from a pleading an insufficient defense or any redundant, immaterial, impertinent, or scandalous matter. Meanwhile, Rule 7A lists what is a pleading. Only these pleadings are allowed, a complaint, an answer, an answer to a counterclaim, an answer to a cross-claim, a third-party complaint, an answer to a third-party complaint, and a reply to an answer. But that's it. That's it. Those are pleadings. If it's not one of those things, it's not a pleading, it's something else. As a procedural matter, plaintiff's motion is improper because, simply stated, a motion is not a pleading, <laughs> and so is not subject to plaintiff's Rule 12F motion to strike. A motion to dismiss is not a pleading. By the very text of the rule cited by plaintiff, then this motion may not be granted. She asks that a motion be stricken, but a motion is not a pleading. While the court has the inherent power to strike a motion, it does not find good cause to do so. Defendant's motion is properly filed, and plaintiff does not bring any argument that cannot be contained in an opposition. Any evidentiary and procedural, procedural objections to the motion must be contained within the brief or memorandum. Plaintiff argues that defendant's motion to declare plaintiff a vexatious, a vexatious litigant should have been separately filed in accordance with Rule 11c. However, as stated by defendant, defendant's motion is brought under the All Writs Act. As such, the constraints of Rule 11c do not apply. I, I'm going to guess 1651A is this one about um, informal pauperous. Let me see if I get this right or not. 28 U.S.C. 1651A. Uh, looks kind of like this. Okay, no, this is, uh, this is not that. This is this is not the court's inherent uh, or, or the the code's ability to uh, have a court can scrutinize an informal pauperous um, litigant. This is not that. This is what do we say? B or A? We said A. The Supreme Court and all courts established by an act of Congress, which would include Article Three courts, 
may issue all writs necessary or appropriate to aid in their respective jurisdictions and agreeable to the usages and principles of law. Okay, so Google brought this under the All Writs Act. Okay, I, I guess that's maybe that's how you bring a vexatious litigant motion. I've never brought one, never considered having to bring one, never studied up on how to bring one. So that's now we all know 28 USC 1651A. Look that up next time you need to bring a vexatious litigant motion. So plaintiff's motion to strike the motion to dismiss and the vexatious litigant motion is denied. Next, defendant's motion to dismiss. Defendant is Google, not Polano. I messed that up. Defendant argues plaintiff's claim of copyright infringement should be dismissed because fair use bars plaintiff's claim. Finally, how many pages are we? Nine halfway through this thing and we're finally discussing fair use. Specifically, defendant asserts there is a fair use because, one, the allegedly infringing icon is a transformative use of plaintiff's live stream. Two, the live stream was of minimally creative value. And three, the icon is of a small portion. And four, plaintiff has not alleged any economic impact. Legal standard, a party may move to dismiss for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. To overcome, a plaintiff's factual allegations must suggest that the claim has at least a plausible chance of success. That word plausible does a lot of work there. It's got to be plausible, not just merely possible. The court accepts factual, factual allegations as true and construes the pleadings in the light or way most favorable to the non-moving party, just like that summary judgment motion. However, conclusory allegations of law and unwarranted inferences are insufficient to avoid a dismissal. The fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. We have four factors that are considered for the fair use of another's copyright. This is the way that we embody First Amendment principles in copyright law. One, the purpose and character of the secondary use, including whether such secondary use is of commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Uh, that key word is going to be um, the purpose and character, or transformation is what that's going to be uh, called. Uh, two, the nature of the copyrighted work, probably the least important of the four. Uh, three, the amount used in relation to the original work as a whole. And four, the effect of the uh, use, the secondary use on the potential market value for the work. This is the sort of market substitution principle. If, uh, if you bootleg a DVD, you know, you, you buy a $10 bootleg DVD on the corner or street, some, some street corner in Manhattan, and uh, like you do. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that substitutes perfectly for having bought the work, assuming my hypothetical is not, you know, poor quality copy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you want to go watch the B movie, and so you get it on the street, you get it off of BitTorrent or whatever, that's a perfect substitute. That's what uh, item four or element four of the fair use factors is talking about. The court does not consider these factors in isolation. It weighs them together in light of the law's purpose, quote, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by protecting artistic and scientific works while encouraging the development and evolution of new works. That is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution, the Copyright Clause or the Intellectual Property Clause. Uh, fair use is a mixed question of law and fact, etc., so now we finally get to the fair use analysis. The court addresses the exhibits attached to defendant's motion to dismiss. Exhibit A is a declaration of Jason Mollick Esquire and a screenshot of the alleged YouTube channel. Uh, exhibit A attached to the declaration of Nea Reedy, Reddy is a copy of the icon and another is a copy of the background of the YouTube channel. And the court says it can take judicial notice of things within its jurisdiction, things that can be readily ac accessed, and things that uh, the authenticity of which um, are not really in question. 
So, on the first factor, the purpose and character of the use, we have, we have a new sentence, we have a new definition from the Andy Warhol case. The first factor focuses on whether an allegedly infringing use has a further purpose or different character, which is a matter of degree, and the degree of difference must be weighed against other considerations like commercialism. It's a great sentence. I, it's all clear up for me. I don't even need to explain it to you guys because, you know, that that's the clearest sentence in the history of copyright fair use law. So if you guys have any idea how that sentence clarifies transform transformative fair use, I, I, I don't know. But that's the new sentence. The central question for the first factor is whether the new work merely supersedes the objects of the original creation, supplanting the original, substituting, or it maybe adds something new instead with a further purpose or different character, which that is what we want in a fair use. Whether a use shares the purpose or character of an original work or instead has a further purpose or different character is a matter of degree. The larger the difference, the more likely the fair use. The smaller the difference, the less likely. The fair use provision and the first factor in particular requires an analysis of the specific use of a copyright work that is alleged to be an infringement. Criticism of a work, for instance, ordinarily does not supersede the objects of or supplant the work. Rather, it uses the work to serve a distinct end, a different end. Here, as alleged, the icon is part of a YouTube channel that is dedicated to harassing, doxing, and impersonating plaintiff. This context supports the finding that the icon is a transformative use. It is used to criticize plaintiff. Plaintiff attempts to draw a distinction between the purpose of criticism and harassment. However, that appears to be a matter of perspective, and Plaintiff does not cite to any authority to support his argument that such a distinction actually exists. Regardless, Plaintiff does not dispute that the use of the icon at issue is distinct from the live stream where Plaintiff alleges that the icon was taken. Plaintiff further confirms this in his opposition, the, uh, the context of the transformative use is used to criticize Plaintiff. Um, see opposition's motion to dismiss uh, paragraph 36 as evidenced by his video library, his entire purpose for this channel seems to have me put on public display for mockery and degradation like a circus freak. Yeah, we saw this in the, what was it, the Hagenda versus uh, Klein the Matt Haas case, the, the H3H3 case, like the original one. Um, I believe it was one of Matt Haas's arguments was that it was uh, mocking him or something, and that was one of the, the fair use factors that was in Klein's favor. And I think it came up again in um, uh, uh, the she will, she, we thought she would win the, um, the election one, Akilah Hughes. Akilah Hughes admitted that the channel was mocking her, which that's a key component of fair use is to criticize your opponent, is to criticize somebody you don't like. You can make a fair use of my videos and criticize me. That's allowed. I can't stop you. The point, that's the point, is that I would stop you, is that, that the subject would stop you, the subject of the criticism and the mockery would stop you if they could. So you have to have a legal recognition to make a mockery or criticism of something in order to have a First Amendment right to it, in order to recognize the First Amendment in copyright law, in order to, to give you that right to speak against something. You're not substituting you're not piggybacking you are there's there's a little bit of piggybacking though in mocking isn't there you could make a successful career of just mocking but that also seems to be a core foundational constitutional principle of american jurisprudence american law so such criticism falls squarely into transformative use as it serves a different purpose than plaintiff's live stream video. Plaintiff argues that the icon was not transformative because the two words added onto the icon 
Acer Thorn Laws tells us nothing. Oh my God, was that the icon? The icon says Acer Thorn Laws, as as in like he's a lawyer, like he knows the law, which obviously like he doesn't. Tells us nothing. The near total lack of creative effort expended in creating this threadbare, threadbare meme should be rejected by the court as transformative, as not transformative. However, plaintiff misunderstands the law. A use that has further purpose or different character is transformative. Thus, while the actual changes to an original work can support whether the subsequent work is transformative, that is not the metric. Uh, I get this question all the time. How much of a copyrighted work do I have to change before I can use it as my own? That's not the standard. That's not how it's measured. Quote, although new expression may be relevant to whether copying has a distinct purpose, transformative purpose, it is not dispositive of the first factor. So while plaintiff focuses on the two words added to the image, he ignores the change in the background, which has been replaced with a red background. Plaintiff also argues that there is a commercial use, which weighs against finding the icon transformative. However, it is unclear whether the icon is being used for commercial purpose. There are no allegations to suggest this. And when comparing the icon and the original work, an icon cannot supplant the videos lasting three hours, 52 minutes, and 28 seconds. So the court still, on the fair use, just, just the first fair use factor, the court finds in favor of fair use. The second fair use factor recognizes that creative works are closer to the core of intended copyright protection than informational works, functional works, factual works. The Ninth Circuit has noted that this nature of the copyrighted work factor typically has not been terribly significant in the overall fair use balancing. Here, the live stream where the icon was taken from was one in which plaintiff and another individual primarily exchanged opinions about a game called Dark Souls, as well as that skill, as well as the skill with which plaintiff alleged handled something handled feedback regarding his prior criticism of that game. While plaintiff presented his opinions in the live stream, the work is undoubtedly more informational than creative. As such, the copyright protection is thin. Accordingly, the court finds this factor neutral, or slightly in favor of finding fair use. Uh, what would have pushed the court away from that? Like, I'm doing a live stream now. Isn't this considered creative as opposed to informational? I don't know. I'm not really, like, setting a camera in a great, you know, I'm not really, like, making an aperture adjustment and, you know, lighting and all that. I mean, I guess I, I do, like, you know, light things so that you can see me, but this is all very functional. This is all very factual. I'm not really, even the information I'm giving you, like this, this is not my, I didn't write this. This doesn't belong to me. You, you can use that. Uh, so I would say that my nature of the copyrighted work for my live stream here would be less protected than say the Barbie movie. You get it? Like lots more creativity and lots, lots more, um, fictional creativity less i'm doing factual creativity so it's less protected still protected just less protected so not a uh not a fair use the amount and substantiality of the portions used well i mean not a fair use on the second factor the third factor examines the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. So that's the, the portion used is the secondary use. It, how much did they use of the original work in the secondary work? And how much did they need to use, basically? Here, the allegedly infringing icon is one video frame from a four-hour video. This is undoubtedly a small portion of the copyrighted work. In addition, the video frame used for the icon is the minimal amount necessary for the purpose of criticism. The substantiality factor will weigh uh, generally in favor of fair use where the amount of copying was tethered to a valid and transformative purpose. While plaintiff argues that the video frame used for the icon is the heart of the video, plaintiff cites no authority to support this argument. 
the court is not persuaded. It is unreasonable to suggest that a single video frame represents the heart of a four-hour video of opinion about a video game. Accordingly, the court finds this factor in favor of fair use. So he tried to argue that using a frame of the video to create an icon somehow attacked the heart of his copyrighted work. Was there, is there a heart to, like, okay, so you've all got that song that gets stuck in your head and the hook of the song gets stuck in your head and it, you know, uh, never going to give you up, never going to let you down, and you get this stuck in your head, that's the hook of the song or, or that's an important part of the song. If I go and make a new copyrighted work of my own using those important lines of the song, then, then yes, I can get sued for copyright infringement. That's less of a fair use than if I use something more important. So he's saying that this icon that was created from a frame of video has used the heart of his video, that that's the most important part of his video. Could a single frame that was a major spoiler for a video game be the heart of a product? Much closer. That is much closer to a, to a fair use if it was uh, either uh, you know, some kind of frame that showed something that is the heart of the work. Um, you know, the monster is revealed at the end of a, of a long story-based game or something. Yeah, that's much closer. But it's also still going to be pretty easy to make a fair use of a single frame by talking about, oh, look, this is the monster that's revealed at the end of the thing. This is how they drew the monster, or how, you know, what's what the monster looks like, is, is already starting to be a fair use. So I don't think... <laughs> so I don't think uh, it necessarily makes it that much easier. Um, but yes, there's, these things are weighed on a spectrum and yeah, you're pushing the needle more towards, uh, the protectable side of things. If there is something very creative contained in that frame, but show me that case because that doesn't sound like a real common case. Okay. Four hour opinion video, video game, single frame, not a fair use. Finally, the market substitution factor. Whether the effect of the copying in the market for the value of the copyrighted work, uh, or how much does it affect it, or does it affect it, it requires courts to consider not only the extent of market harm caused by particular actions, but also whether unrestricted and widespread conduct of the same sort would result in a substantially adverse impact on the potential market for the original. So it's the actual market harm of this, as well as the sort of slippery slope argument. What happens if everybody does this? Is it okay if everybody feeds everybody's copyrighted works into AI learning algorithms so that, so that ChatGPT type models can all learn? Like, is it okay to take everyone's copyrighted works and do that? Like, you know, that's a... Is that a market substitute? Uh, you know, I don't know. But when you're anal analyzing that, if you allowed widespread, unrestricted conduct, you know, okay, so that's conduct that's widespread and unrestricted right now. Here, it is not reasonable to suggest that the allegedly infringing icon has any significant effect on the copyrighted video. Plaintiff does not appear to directly address defendant's argument that there is no protectable derivative market for criticism. Regardless, due to the stage of this case, the court finds this fact either neutral or slightly finding fair use. There, there is no protectable derivative market for criticism. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. You don't hire somebody to make criticism about you. I, I mean, maybe there's someone really smart out there. I could imagine a Kardashian doing something like this and then, you know, thriving off of the controversy. But generally, don't pay somebody to sincerely and genuinely criticize you. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of roasts. I know what a roast is. I'm not talking about that. In assessing all the factors, the court finds the defendant has met all the fair use factors, and the court grants fair use. There we go.
While leave to amend should be liberally granted, the court finds that under the allegations pled, there are no additional allegations that could remedy plaintiff's claim. As such, the court finds it would be futile to allow plaintiff to amend. So what does that mean? If the court said, uh, you know, I have almost enough information to make a determination, but this last part, like I really can't tell if you used all of it or some of it, or I really can't tell on the market substitution factor or something, maybe the court could grant the party leave to amend the plaintiff, leave to amend the complaint to fix that. But the judge is saying here, there isn't anything you can allege here to fix this. The, no matter how you, you know, paint this picture, this icon is not going to be enough to grant some sort of copyright remedy. Finally, defendants motion to declare plaintiff a vexatious litigant. Defendant additionally moves to declare plaintiff a vexatious litigant. Under the All Writs Act 28 U.S.C. 1651A, provides district courts with the inherent power to enter pre-filing orders against vexatious litigants, according to Molsky v. Evergreen Dynasty Corporation, a Ninth Circuit case from 2007. Flagrant abuse of the judicial process cannot be tolerated because it enables one person to preempt the use of judicial time that properly could be used to consider the meritorious claims of other litigants. Waste. It wastes the court's time. Four factors are considered. The litigant must be given notice and a chance to be heard. Okay, that's due process. Second, the district court must compile an adequate record. Also due process. Third, the district court must make substantive findings about the frivolous or harassing nature of the plaintiff's litigation, which is also due process. Finally, the vexatious litigant order, so the final order, must be narrowly tailored to closely fit the specific vice encountered. That is also due process. That is uh, strict scrutiny uh, that the, the remedy must be narrowly tailored to, to meet a compelling government interest. And so the narrowest possible uh, order that accomplishes the government's goal of, of mitigating the vexatious litigant, that will survive strict scrutiny that will survive a due process challenge. So the first factor requires a litigant be given an opportunity to oppose the order. The requirement that the plaintiff receive an opportunity to be heard satisfies due process requirements. Here, plaintiff has had an opportunity to file and did file an opposition. That's all, that re that's, all that's required here. Adequate record. An adequate record for review should include a listing of all the cases and motions that led the district court to conclude that a vexatious, vexatious litigant order was needed. Here we go. Defendant has provided an extensive list of some of the cases filed by plaintiff. Stebbins v. Polano. Plaintiff is warned that if he persists in filing frivolous or meritless lawsuits, the court may impose sanctions or bar him from filing further actions without prior approval or deem him a vexatious litigant. Stebbins v. Rabolo. Plaintiff's attempts to manufacture and pursue ultimately meritless copyright infringement claims in an effort to silence online criticism smacks of bad faith and abuse of the court system, plaintiff's bad faith and his history of filing frivolous lawsuits further justifies dismissal without leave to amend. Stebbins v. Google, uh, from 2011. As stated above, plaintiff's claim is based on an indisputably meritless legal theory. Stebbins v. Stebbins. I think I need to hear more about this. An Eighth Circuit case from 2014. We also conclude that the court did not abuse its discretion in imposing the filing restrictions because it is undisputed that Stebbins has proceeded in form of pauperous on 16 complaints that proved meritless and has filed numerous frivolous motions since May of 2010. I don't know who Stebbins v. Stebbins is, but there is one for us to look up later. Stebbins v. Brad Bradford from Arkansas, 2013. Stebbins claims in the instant matter are patently frivolous and have no basis in fact. Stebbins v. Hickson. 
The court finds that Mr. Stebbins' recent practice of filing lawsuits in the Eastern District and waiting for them to be transferred to the Western District is a transparent end run around this court's filing restrictions, which were imposed on him in a previous case number. So he was filing the cases in the Eastern District. They would notice that and then transfer them to the Western District where he wasn't supposed to file. But now he suddenly has a case filed because the court, just, you know, entered it. The court, the one court. The Eastern Court just sort of put it in the Western Court. Stebbins v. Microsoft, 2012. His complaint is wildly untethered from any valid interpretation of contract and arbitration law, and time spent dealing with Mr. Stebbins' filings prevents the court from addressing genuine, vexing problems that people trust the court to resolve quickly and fairly. For that reason, the court will sanction him next time he files a similarly frivolous complaint. And Stebbins v. Texas... Because plaintiff has filed four prior actions to confirm non-existent arbitration awards, two of which have already been dis... Oh, is he one of those? Did, was he doing the arbitration thing, those fake... Remember, there was that fake arbitration award thing. You could get that... Oh, I forget who it was. You could get that one guy to, like, make you a fake arbitration award or whatever and then try to, like, enter it and then try to, like, like get it enforced even though it was fake, and then everybody had to figure that out. Oh, I forget what case that was. We're going to remember what that is and post that in a bubble someplace. Plaintiff should be warned that if he persists in filing frivolous lawsuits over which the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction, the court may impose monetary sanctions, etc. The court also notes the hundreds of motions that have been filed in these cases along with those Along with those filed in this case, this factor is met as the court has listed and discussed these cases. Like the court's like, okay, check this off my list. <laughs> Substantive findings as to frivolous or harassing nature. The third factor gets to the heart of the vexatious litigant analysis and requires the court to look to both the number and content of the filings as indicia of the frivolousness of plaintiff's claims. The plaintiffs must, the claims must not only be numerous, but also patently or obviously without merit. Plaintiff has been declared a vexatious litigant in the Western District of Arkansas and has been repeatedly warned by courts in this district. Plaintiff makes several arguments that have no merit. For example, plaintiff attaches an email to show that he consulted with legal counsel. However, the exhibit does not support this characterization, as the attachment appears to show plaintiff's communications with an unknown individual. Plaintiff also argues that the instant case is not frivolous. However, plaintiff's conduct in filing hundreds of motions that have little merit in this and other cases satisfies this factor. And while plaintiff asserts that he has used the court's pro bono program, the third factor still weighs in defendant's favor because plaintiff continues to repeatedly file numerous claims and motions with limited merit. Moreover, it appears that the motive for plaintiff's filing of the instant and similar lawsuits are to stop harassment from other users online. For example, plaintiff's claim in this case is against the Acer Thorn, the True Acer Thorn channel, a YouTube channel allegedly set up to harass him. During a case management conference, plaintiff stated that he seeks to stop the harassment directed against him. However, this is not a proper use of copyright law. So I'm sympathetic to someone who wants to stop harassment in general. I'm sympathetic to someone who wants to stop illegal harassment. But you cannot use copyright law to do it. That is not a, a, a use. That is not a proper use of copyright law. And finally, the proposed order must be narrowly tailored. Defendant's proposal. So this is, remember, this is defendant's motion to find Acer Thorn a vexatious litigant. So defendant's proposal has necessarily contained a proposed order, what they want the court to enter. So defendant's proposed order requires plaintiff to obtain pre-filing uh, order from the court. So a pre-filing order from the court before filing any complaint identifying Google, Alphabet, YouTube, their affiliates, and any copyright claims against any other defendants. 
Defendant also proposes that plaintiff be prohibited from proceeding in for a pauperous in any future actions in the district except upon a showing of good cause. The court finds this appropriate. The group of defendants listed by defendant is appropriate. Plaintiff has repeatedly sought to file claims against users of platforms operated by this group of defendants. Additionally, plaintiff has brought copyright claims of little merit against his critics, whom he considers harassing him online. Although the court is cognizant of the dangers of cyberbullying, the court reiterates that copyright law is not the appropriate vehicle to seek a remedy. The court likewise finds it appropriate that plaintiff be subjected to a pre-screening prior to filing any future actions in which plaintiff seeks to proceed in for pauperous. Courts should not be forced to expend judicial resources where plaintiff does not even, at a minimum, pay the filing fee. For the foregoing reasons, plaintiff's motion for leave to file an amended complaint is denied, plaintiff's summary judgment motion is denied, plaintiff's motion to strike is denied, Defendant's motion to dismiss is granted, defendant's motion to declare plaintiff a vexatious litigant is granted, and plaintiff has not been given leave to amend his complaint. In addition, plaintiff David A. Stebbins is declared a vexatious litigant in this district. As such, any future actions against Google, YouTube, Alphabet, affiliates, or any copyright claim must be provided to the clerk of the court along with a letter requesting the complaint be filed. The clerk will forward the complaint letter and a copy of this order to the duty judge for a determination whether the complaint should be accepted for filing. Plaintiff is warned that any violation of this order will expose him to contempt proceedings and appropriate sanctions, and any action filed in violation of this order will be dismissed. Further, in any future action in which Mr. Stebbins seeks to proceed in forma pauperis as a poor person and not paying fees, a copy of this order shall be attached to the application seeking to proceed in forma pauperis along with a statement seeking screening of the complaint and a statement explaining why the action should be allowed to proceed. And that is Judge Trina L. Thompson, United States District Judge for the Northern District of California. And I see one of you has found... Stebbins v. Stebbins. Let's, where was that? You just had it up on a screen, Leonard. Yes. Let's take a look just real quick here in uh, Court Listener, if we can. Go to the Recap Archive, docket number 3130. Stebbins v. Stebbins. Complaint. He sued Rita F. Stebbins and David D. Stebbins. Uh, oh my goodness, are those his parents? The defendants who are biologically my parents have listed me as a dependent on their tax return despite not paying my living expenses for that year or only paying them for part of the year. I know this is illegal. I, I, I don't know what happened to it. I don't want to further prolong this live stream. Uh, it looks like, it looks like it may have been denied. He did the whole writ of mandamus thing. He did the whole motion to disqualify judge thing. Uh, he has a notice of appeal. More notices of appeal. Holy goodness. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he won this case. Let's take another quick look here. Upon careful review, we conclude the district court properly dismissed the complaint for failure to state a claim. Wow. So, yeah, he uh, he sued his parents for listing him as a dependent. Now, he may, I don't know, he may have had a claim. I don't, I, I, I do know this one a little bit, not this case, but this law. Um, you know, if, if you list someone as a dependent, they actually have to have been your dependent. Uh, if they don't meet the criteria as a dependent and you list them as a dependent, it will screw up their tax refund. So if Mr. Stebbins was expecting a tax refund and his parents listed him as a dependent and they file his, their taxes before him, 
uh, they'll, their taxes will get processed first, and then he will be in the system as a dependent of them. And if he tries to file his taxes after that, e-file his taxes, he'll get kicked out because he's a dependent of somebody else. So he then would have to print his taxes and file them manually, like by mailing it in. And then he gets a letter, an office action from the IRS saying, hey, you're a dependent of somebody else. And you have to figure this all out. How do I know this? Well, I, I used to... I used to be a, a, a site coordinator for the VITA volunteer income tax program. And we, I did hundreds of people's taxes. And uh, this happened all the time. And people were super upset that uh, spouse A would get the dependent uh, claim, the, the claim for the dependent um, status or whatever. And then spouse B would miss out. And they would, no, I was the one who took care of the kid this year. And you, I, I was my year to claim or whatever. And they would get all upset with each other. Yeah. So um, that's an entirely possible thing that happened. I, you know, it, I, I feel for the guy that, that, you know, he keeps thinking things are happen to, happening to him. He probably needs some kind of help, um, probably needs to be treated for something. But um, this is a strange presentation of that illness to just your thing is just to file things in court forever i don't know it's just a, it's a weird thing i guess i guess everybody's got their thing right i got my thing i make youtube videos and represent people who are accused of copyright infringement um <laughs> so that's my thing he wants to be a permanent i don't i know I, yeah i don't know okay so what if he sues in a different district well all of this is creating a longer and longer and longer record and the next victim will be able to point to this and yes it's an imperfect system because it's many different districts in 50 different states you know it, even though it's supposed to be some kind of federalized union of member states and there's supposed to be some kind of uniformity to things there's still cracks uh, to the inconsistency and, and it still cracks and inconsistencies to the system. Uh, thank you, Captain Mizaki. Okay, so I've had you now for an hour and 11 minutes. Um, what well, shout out to my supporters because this is not a, uh, we don't, this is not a commercial uh, supported channel. This is not a, uh, Spons yeah, my sponsors are individual people, is what I'm trying to say, that support me because they love me and, and I love them and they want to see more of my content and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't take commercial sponsors, I guess. How do you say that? That's the way I'm saying it. So the people who support me are in my description here that I'm delaying and getting up because they are Evie, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, Good Brooch, In uh, King Aries, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Kyle Seifring, Please Do Not Credit This Account, and AKA Mr. Boone. Guy Chapman, thank you for your, uh, for letting me know about this. Uh, Guy was the one who emailed, was the first one to email me about this. Uh, the Sid Alpha case was tossed before the because the judge denied inform pauperis. Uh, that's possible. There is a law that allows judges to scrutinize cases that are presented IFP or inform pauperis. So Stebbins makes his he files his complaint. He makes his IFP motion, and the judge is allowed to scrutinize his complaint a little bit more. So the thing is, there's thousands of people. There's dozens, maybe even hundreds of judges in the federal system and yeah, I guess there's hundreds. Yeah. And, uh, they're not going to know David Stebbins except for like a handful of judges who actually had to deal with him. So they have to rely on court clerks and, uh, and parties, opposing parties notifying the court of what's going on. Is that a crack in the system? Yes. Do I deal with it every day when I explain to clients why they have to fight their case, even though they are innocent or even though they are, you know, maybe not as subject to liability as the plaintiff thinks they are. That's still unfair that they have to defend themselves in court. So there is a crack in the system there to be remedied. You know, how do we, how do we even the playing field between a plaintiff and a defendant, not in some unfair way, but in some way that makes it more fair for parties. But that's a discussion for another video. Let me know what you think about this one in the comments below. I love you all. I'll see you in the next one. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, 
and this is Lawful Masses, and I'll see you later. Take care. Bye.